Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And I have assembled the Dream Team Real World New Orleans Homecoming Roundtable. I have two of your favorites, Ryan Bailey and Jamie Stein. Now, let me introduce each of them separately because there's quite a bit here. Ryan Bailey is the host of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey, a wildly popular Bravo pop culture podcast. And he's a huge real world fan. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have Jamie Stein, who is an empath and an intuitive, which basically means he's the ability to receive psychic information, as well as the ability to feel, see and hear what's going inside of you on an unconscious level. Not only that, but back in his early Hollywood days, Jamie worked on four seasons of The Real World as an associate editor. He worked on Vegas, Paris, San Diego, and Philly. And so he's certainly going to bring a lot of insight in terms of the behind the scenes working for Buna Murray into this conversation, I'm sure. So having said all that, please welcome Ryan Bailey and Jamie Stein, kings of L.A., Come on, be my baby tonight. OMG. <laughs> How are you guys? Good. I'm I'm good. I feel like this real world homecoming by far has received the most amount of press. Like I want to kind of t- compare this to the New York and LA homecomings to sort of like guide us into this because to me, it's night and day in terms of the amount of media coverage. I mean, the New York Times went to Danny's home in Vermont. Have you guys noticed like a drastic amount of media coverage as compared to even the New York one, which did get a lot of press, but it did not feel like this? I mean, I don't know if I've noticed the media coverage, but I've definitely noticed the social media response in a way that I didn't notice with the first two. And for me, my take in on it has been sort of a generational thing. Like it's felt to me like, you know, as someone who is in his 40s and did watch New York and L.A. in their first run, I felt like I was watching more people in their 30s talking about this and that they had watched this was what they had watched in their first run and so the energy has just felt more alive to me on social media whereas I kind of felt like I felt like an old grandpa being excited about New York and LA and now I kind of feel like I'm in it with the younger generation I've been screaming about this from the first iteration of New York homecoming I'm happy that people are catching up to it or at least I'm hoping that's what I'm viewing but also I can be a little desensitized and I feel like we're in a cultural vacuum in terms of what we do so we're hyper focused on these things and I get scared because I'll shout out at my audience or even just like family and friends of like, you know, this is on. They have still no idea that any of this is on. They still don't know this is happening. And they're like, oh, my God, I would I would totally watch that. And I'm like, you should. I want this to keep going. So as much noise as can be made about all of this stuff, I also think it depends on the person. I know Melissa is so vocal about this show. She plays along every day on social media. Uh, Danny, I mean, as a heterosexual man. I was ignorant to the fact of how much Danny meant to uh, a gay audience. Like, really? I wasn't ignorant, but it didn't, you know, like, I hear personal stories from my gay friends now. Well, I don't like to brag about it because it's not something to be proud of. I mean, this could could ruin your career. That's right. I know. I've said it a couple times lately, and I feel really like I'm like, I'm just testing the waters if if it pulls well, me being straight. Um, <laughs> but like, no, I'll hear personal stories of like how much Danny's story moved them or inspired them. And it's so cool because I get to experience it kind of from a different uh, angle now. I'm like, that is so exciting. And that's what New York and uh, L.A. didn't have in the reboots is there weren't these stories about like, like Danny seems like he affected so many people. I mean, not to say the others didn't but it's so it's such a different take on on these shows i mean i think by far jamie you and i have talked about this like if we're looking at it from a purely superficial level this is the most attractive cast of the original (laughs) and youngest i mean to be fair they're 10 years younger than new york let's get to las vegas baby that's a hot (laughs) cast but like hawaii hot cast yeah hawaii was a hot cast but like up until this point i feel like new orleans definitely it's like you've got a cast full of stars like if you really look at them maybe with the exception of matt although i feel like we're going to be talking talking about him a ton tonight i feel like this cast they have star quality they have star power even like sociopaths like julie like you kind of can't stop looking at her in those fucking lularoe because they're not lululemon those are lula full lularoe leggings that she is wearing yeah 
She looks great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I did rewatch the 2000 season in preparation for Homecoming. And um, I will say I was really struck by the fact that there wasn't a single clunker in the cast. It really felt like these are seven dynamic personalities with strong points of view and each one of them really felt like a very unique specific spoke on the wheel whereas I feel like usually in other seasons no disrespect there will be the Muhammad who seems cool but isn't really necessarily interacting with the house or bringing a strong point of view or race car driver Mike in London there were no casualties <laughs> in the original season of re- real world New Orleans. Like they were all kind of coming with a strong fire and flavor and point of view for sure. I mean, you could argue potentially Jamie and Kelly in this iteration uh, are not popping like they did on the original. Like, you know, like, and, but it's not, and that's, that's not true either because then like Kelly said some stuff in this past episode that I, I really enjoyed uh, knowing about her family life and how it's made her feel really safe and it's made her feel not safe being uh, not around them and being around people like Julie. I find that aspect of it uh, really fascinating. But for me, like they had so much star quality in the original uh, iteration that sometimes I feel like they're getting lost. Like even in this weird Julie, Jamie love, tr- whatever is happening, I still feel like I'm not fully getting Jamie's perspective. Like it's almost I'm like, Jamie, are you sure? Are you do you agree with the she- you guys are into each other? Yeah, like I mean, well, but that, that I'm going to blame on production. And I want to talk about production like in a second and the way the show is edited. Like there's a lot going on. But I guess like the final thought I have is I know that going into this, I think they had they had like a total of a three season order of Homecoming. That's it. Yeah. Up until this. No, wait, don't worry. Don't jump off a ledge yet. Oh, Up okay. until this point, because I don't know what the viewership or you know quote unquote ratings were for the first two but i cannot imagine a world after the success of this version i cannot see a world in which there's not going to be another one i want to believe you but it really does scare me in the sense that like i said i don't know how much of a vacuum we're in so for me it is something that i look forward to every week when it like I'm like okay 12 midnight it's up in Los Angeles you know you get really excited I get and I get so sad knowing that it's coming to an ending again pretty soon but that I also have been mistaken before going my taste dictate what popular culture should be and as I get older I'm it's slipping away where I'm like oh shoot like it is not that that's not the case like what I love I have to convince other people to love and pay attention to but then you get online and I'll check out like other real world cast members like Hawaii I'll go like Amaya like I had the biggest crush on Amaya I remember and uh, you know, it's like she doesn't have tons of followers. She doesn't have to. And I'm like, oh, no, no, she's no, not in but the social Ryan, media game? Ma- Ryan, Melissa did not have a public Instagram and Twitter account until this was like a week from the premiere. She has been operating under a private in- Instagram. Despite having a podcast, she has been like very deliberate in keeping a very private online presence up until this. So I don't know that that is a yeah. barometer for anything. You know, and I don't know if this is getting ahead of ourselves, but I will say I'm finding as homecoming evolves and develops, I'm definitely finding myself in a very ambivalent relationship with it where Part of me, like you're saying, Ryan, I'm so excited. And I'll watch every single one they fucking throw at me. Um, I love catching up with these people. I love the novelty of the cast coming back together. I love all of it. And I also want to say, you know, I felt like this was creeping in with L.A., but I'm really feeling it in New Orleans. I just feel like the lack of trust Mm-hmm. From the cast members to production, I feel their ambivalence. I feel the part of them that's like, why am I doing this? Should I be here? I have a real life outside of this. Is this going to fuck things up? And, you know, I feel I feel the tension I, and I feel what's being held back. And it starts to become a strange experience for me watching. It's a little bit dark. Because things feel a little bit unsent- unsettled and disjointed, and there's a lot that's not being said. And I don't know, it just makes me wonder about where this is all going. And yeah, how many casts do we have kind of to look forward to? And is it always going to be this uneasy feeling of, I kind of want to be here, but I kind of don't want to be here. And I'm keeping a lot of my cards close to my chest because I don't trust production and I don't trust the people around me either. 
Yeah, just for like transparency's sake, I want to say that Kelly has not yet left, yet it is very clear, like we're going to act, we're going to talk about her leaving because it's very clear at this point that she is the one who does leave. So we just want to like, even though this is like our, this is the final act in my trilogy of Real World New Orleans (laughs) episodes. Um, And also, Ryan, you know how you were saying before, like this is sort of the culture that you are living and breathing. I've been feeling like this is my... And just like that of the season, meaning this is the thing that I am so it's like I finally have something to chew on on this podcast, whereas like Housewives like goes in and out this I could talk about. Like, I could do 20 episodes on this uh, the way I yeah. did on, on and just like that in the sense that, like, it's kind of endless. And so I love that. So I do feel that impending doom. Like, I used to say, like, I'm going to jump off a building when and just like that ends because, like, what am I going to do with my life? Thank God this came into it. But, like, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Two quick things I want to pose at each of you. What is your guess as to how much they were paid. Now, when I, I interviewed Danny, he confirmed that they all were paid the same amount. What do you think that number is? How long are in the how long are they in the house for? I think they filmed for two weeks, but they all then they had there was a quarantine period prior to that. Uh, one hundred and twenty grand. Jamie. Um, I, yeah, I've heard low six figures. My, my, yeah, my first kind of understanding or sense was around a hundred or 150,000, but maybe that's gone up to around low twos. I definitely saw this in print. Um, it may actually be in the Danny New York times article. It was confirmed that it was the low two hundreds. So I am interpreting that as like two twenty five. Um, that number feels right. Given its place in pop culture history, but we're also decades out, um, and given that, for example, a popular housewife will make 500000 for a full season, I think that feels good. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic number. For, for somebody like Jamie, who we don't even know. I mean, and this is like my issue with production is we still don't even know what Jamie does for a living. And yeah. I find like major flaws in that and in some of the storytelling. That's a great number for them to like sock away, put away for kids college fund. And like, I feel like it, it that's a real yeah. blessing coming out life. of co- coming out of covid. There's I think it's it's dead on for what they could get. You know, it, it's not. And I don't mean this disrespectfully, because for me, it's it's it means more to me than sex in the city. But I know for like sex in the city, you know, you have and just like that, they're they're getting in the millions, you know, they're getting in like that's because re- it's a different thing. It's a different it's a different animal and a, a different pop culture animal. So, of course, they're going to draw so much more money and so many more eyes to it. So that I'm just like, I'm happy for th- them to get anything doing this, you know? Yeah. And it's a nice footnote because, you know, to your point, Jess, they did earn five grand for five to six months of work. You know, obviously that was syndicated into all hell and none of the cast saw any of it. So it seems like a nice gift for the cast members who'd really never got much of anything for their original representation. Should we do a GoFundMe for these guys? What, should, we, should we do some kind of... I will say, I know that when they did... I don't know who remembers this, but when they did a Vegas Reunited season, five years after Vegas ended, oh. where they were in back in that suite for two weeks, I think that... I want to say that was like 25 grand a piece. So, you know, same amount of time, bumped up quite a lot. Yeah. And then I guess the final question that I'll pose to you guys, and then we'll really dive in, is for, let's just like speak it into existence, for the next one, what would each of your picks be? Which city would you choose? Um, well, I've got, I'll, I'll, I'll make two selections, probably neither of which are going to be popular. Um, I, I feel like I want to see San Francisco. You know, I feel like New York, LA, and San Francisco, those are the three that kicked this off. And I know we don't have Pedro anymore. But we do have Joe, so we'd have seven people. And um, that is a cast that I want to reconnect with. I will say just for my own sentimental reasons, and no one else is going to agree with this, but because um, I did work on The Real World Vegas and it was the first season I worked on, it just has such a soft place in my heart. So I'd like to see Vegas, even though, yeah, I'll leave it there. Wait, why do you think San Francisco would not be a popular pick? Well, I guess I'm just going again off of the difference in social media response that I'm seeing between New York and L.A. and New Orleans. I feel like most people want a Hawaii. They want a Seattle. They want they want one of those seasons. And I feel like I'm going very old school and saying, no, I want San Francisco. 
Ryan. Yeah, I, I would go Hawaii. I mean, Hawaii to me. In fact, I, I went. I bought a bootleg of it from somebody. It's like the worst bootleg of you know, like it's all scratchy and it, but it just meant so much to me for some reason. And it, just the local motion of it all and the tech and Ruthie, Ruthie getting hammered and driving on the first night. You know, like so many amazing moments. Now I agree to Jamie's point though. San Francisco has more cultural relevance as a whole. But then if I walk that down the path, I get nervous we'd be in another loss. Angeles situation of you'd have the intense discussions, but you have Rachel Campos, who is what a Fox News contributor right now and is married to the other dude from uh, Sean Duffy rules or Sean. Yeah. And, And you don't have Pedro there for a voice anymore. Puck. I like, I don't know. Like for some reason, I almost feel like I love that that could potentially be what it is Mm -hmm. and what it'll always be is that moment. You know, you even got to see these beautiful moments even between Rachel and Puck, like hiking to the top of Camelback Mountain, I remember. Like, you know, these kind of things of bridging gaps. But uh, Hawaii, I would be really interested in just because I want to see where the rest of them are. And then I would go actually agree with Jamie completely as Vegas. To me, that was another just, it was an exciting season and kind of to me is the turning point of when uh, real world then kind of all of a sudden became more like the vodka Red Bull, yes. the vodka Red Bull boys. Like yeah. it became different. It became less about the conversations uh, you have as youths and trying to find your way and more about the party lifestyle or having threesomes in a bathtub. You know, I would want again, this may not be a popular opinion. It would be Boston. Boston is the one with Montana, Genesis, Sean Duffy. Now I know that Sean Duffy fully wouldn't do it because of his political career. So that may count out, but I know that they all would be willing to do it. After that, definitely Seattle because of the Irene Steven thing. And also I I loved the other characters like Lindsay and David. And, but I think Jamie, you said that to give us the intel on Irene that she said she would never, ever participate. Like, what intel do you oh, have? No, no, I don't have any behind the scenes intel about that. I just know when she left and for a long time afterwards, she was vocally opposed to anything having to do with the real world. I mean, I think she's one of the first kind of former reality TV cast members to speak out against reality TV. Like, she really had a hard stance on that. Now, That was a long time ago, so maybe things have softened and maybe $225,000 would soften things. I don't know. I just know for a while she she was very, very vocally anti-real world. See, I think she would do it. I think the number, I think the money can motivate pretty much anyone. Sean Duffy doesn't need the money. But I think somebody like Irene, who I know has a child, may or may not be a single mom, why would she turn down that money? Can I just say something quickly about Rachel that ties into New Orleans homecoming? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just responding to your point, Ryan, I actually see I R- Rachel is someone who I would love to see how she is now because, you know, rewatching San Francisco, which I did on Paramount Plus, um, you know, I was just really taken by what an interesting personality she was because she was you know, you could say uber conservative, very outspoken about it, very non-apologetic about it, and also in a way open-minded and willing to have conversations and willing. I mean, she brought Pedro home with her to meet her family and really sort of connected with him in a certain type of way. And I, I guess I just bring that in because I keep thinking about her as I watch Matt on New Orleans, for example, I just keep thinking about Matt and what I find so difficult for me personally to watch about him. Because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I want to be clear, I, I, you know, believe whatever you want to believe religiously. Like, I, I don't care if you think being gay is a sin, like, fine. You know, we all, you know, we're all entitled to our beliefs. But there is something for me that's, that's very I almost want to use the word distasteful about the way that he walks with it because I feel like there's something disingenuous about the way he walks with his religion and his conservatism where he he tries to present himself as this kind of gracious embodiment of Christian love and compassion and he'll insert himself in conversations that have nothing to do with him where he's trying to be the mediator and you know he wants you know he apologizes to Danny earnestly and there's something to me that really disowns you know his beliefs what he's choosing to support and to his point he acknowledges he's involved in a framework that's problematic and it's like that's fine but it's almost like somehow 
you want to participate in that framework, but you still want to be thought of as this nice guy and you want Danny's grace and you want, you, 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 you somehow want it both ways. And I, I just keep thinking about Rachel through all of this. Cause I'm like, you know what? I feel like Rachel, at least she owned who she was and she didn't apologize for it. And she didn't try to like kind of manipulate you into giving her that quote unquote grace. And um, so, yeah, this is my convoluted way of, bringing Matt into it, but also saying Rachel was so interesting and I'd love to see who she is now. To that point, I mean, she is interesting. And I said those moments really did powerfully affect me. But I also think sometimes it's interesting that we can be our most open when we are at our youngest. You know, I've watched a lot of her stuff on online and stuff. And I, I don't it doesn't seem to be very open minded anymore. I could be wrong. And I, I mean, I, I don't even need to be proven wrong. But that's just from my viewpoint and, and a huge fan of hers on that iteration of real world. It, it, well, to even speak to your point about uh, the Danny situation, it's like we literally watch this like. Yeah, you know, like, I just can't imagine the God that created me created you. And, you know, like, God created me in the right way. And, hey, man, I love you, dude. Like, you are awesome. But I just, I know God is so against you. It's not my fault. It's God's. It's not my fault. It's God. God, I love you. but And believe me, I have problems with my religion, too. I'm not going to do anything about it. Right. But I totally, like, that's what he literally, he washes his hands, absolves himself of anything. And since he'll look you in the face and tell you this with a smile, then you're like, Okay, and f- to fucking watch Danny. No, right I think there, Danny to, like, is going to beat watch the him, living like, just da- barely hanging on. Danny's going to beat he's the like, living he's shit like, out of him. Uh, the next. What did you think about the? I'm pretty sure the first one of the first things that Matt said when he came into the house and they were get all getting reoriented was, "Guess how many kids I have." It reminded me of that meme where it says, "Nobody, absolutely nobody." Matt, guess how many kids I have? It's like no one fucking cares. When the producers were pushing him on, you know, his feelings on the the gay topic, when he's like, I think I answered the question or I think we're done on this topic. How did you feel about that? The way he spoke to the producer? Look, Matt's clearly got an edge, you know, and I (laughs) he's a control freak. And there's a lot of rage brewing under there. And I just I get this sense that for him, at least in part, he really uses religion. And I want to be really clear. This is not me knocking Religion. I actually support whatever vehicle is right for people's spiritual life. But I think we all know religion can be used in destructive ways for sure. And I just get this feeling for Matt, religion in the Bible, ultimately on an unconscious level, is a way for him to rise above his own humanity. I think he doesn't want to know these darker parts of himself. I don't think he wants to know his rage. I don't, there's something boiling inside of him. And so it kind of, <laughs> he gets to rise above his own humanity and he gets to preach the word of God, but there's this edge you can feel and so then it comes out in these interviews right when he's not able to control the narrative of Matt as the good devout Christian who's sort of in control of his world and his life that edge starts to come out and for me that's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg of whatever whatever uncomfortable intensity or anger Matt doesn't kind of want to have to get in a relationship with it's like right there in that moment when he's shutting things down. And the Catholic, the Catholicism is self-imposed, right? His fan, he wasn't raised like as devout like this, correct? I heard that somewhere recently. Yeah, like he chose this for himself. It wasn't what he was brought up in. What's the over under on Matt's gay? You know, whether he is or not, that's his struggle. And it would be it would explain a lot of things. But like, listen, he was a creeper back on the show back in like he remember he's like, oh, these girls have all signed my guest book. And I'm like, you know, these girls can subscribe and they'll get my journal and they'll get pictures of me. I'm like, did you start an OnlyFans in like the 90s? Like it is so I was like, what does the Bible say about being creepy towards women? I mean, it's it completely it's another thing where he was able to like since I don't have sex. I'm a good guy. I can be creepy in all of these other ways, but I will never have sex. So I am a religious, pious man. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I just think he's so at odds with his own kind of, yeah, intensity, fire, his own impulses, his own urges, his own anger. And um, I I, want to say, I don't think he's gay. I mean, he seemed like, for example, that woman that he met in New Orleans, Brandy, who, you know, then Julie... Mm -hmm. Uh, fake wrote into his guest book posing as Brandy. I mean, he seemed genuinely attracted to her. Um, And I also want to say he seemed to have some sort of conflicted something kind of attraction around Julie in 2000. Now, I don't know if that was more just him sensing her attraction for him 
and that that kind of turned him on and lit him up and he enjoyed that but he didn't want to admit that he enjoyed it but to ryan's point it definitely felt like there was some sort of charge or satisfaction he was getting out of stoking julie's fire around him but then kind of pointing a finger at her and saying, oh, you're weird, you're overbearing, you're too much, I don't do this, no. Like, I feel like he sort of enjoyed getting a bit of a rise out of her, which again kind of speaks to the flavor of a lot of stuff he's not letting himself know about himself. What happens with religion is it sort of sets itself up there. It's like, oh, we've got the answers, and so if you are trying to avoid yourself and you're trying to defer that personal responsibility, yeah, it's going to be hugely destructive because it's like, oh, these are the rules. And I also just want to say, too, it's like with Matt, I love that he stood there in that kitchen with Kelly and literally was basically saying, well, yeah, technically we're only supposed to have sex if we procreate. And yeah, most people I know just kind of like are willing to overlook that one. But gay people, it's like you are literally acknowledging that there are double standards and people pick and choose what they want to believe. Like you're literally acknowledging that. So basically, and this is what I'm saying. It's like, why can't you just own I've made an arbitrary decision that this is the point where I will no longer let myself question anything and that my choices have an impact on the people around me and on the larger framework of society that's destructive. Like, just say it and own it. You have to look up Matt's... So Matt owns his own, like, design firm, his own, like, you know, tech design firm, and he has a lot of videos, like, that are... They're hosted on YouTube, and they're... I found them all on his website. They are quite compelling jamie wouldn't partake in them he's like i can't handle that but i did watch a few and i'd watch tokyo's cooking videos yeah i can't (laughs) we have to talk about that but um let's segue into julie because this was the most uh demanded topic that we that we really get into i guess to start did you guys know that it was actually her mother who was acting as her agent and writing those letters I did not know. At the time, I remember now hearing about that at the time, and I'd forgotten about it. I, when they were having that like back and forth in the first episode, I, I did have vague recollections of mom, but I didn't realize the mom was like literally acting as her agent. <laughs> Jamie, I mean, where do you want to start with this? Just like, what have you been thinking? The flavor I always get off Julie is kind of something about survival and what it means to survive. Like, she always just feels like someone who's like scrambling to survive. And it's like almost this feeling of like, there's not enough time, there's not enough space, there's not enough for everyone. I gotta do what I gotta do. But also, I'm supposed to be a good girl. So, like, I've got this, like, scrappy fighter in me who's going to do whatever I need to do to, like, get by because I don't trust that there's enough for everyone. But I know I got to make it look and sound good. So I'm never going to, like, cop to what I'm doing. And so it just becomes, like, kind of like this three-ring circus of, like, got to get my needs met. Got to get my needs met. No one – I got to cover my tracks. I got to cover my tracks. And so – You know, where that comes from, I mean, look, there's so much. I mean, the fact, first of all, that her mother apparently was writing those letters, which literally that's about like taking jobs. from. We need the jobs. We need the money, you know, and even Julie saying in that episode, I moved to L.A. because I had nowhere to go. It's like this, you know, I'm all about pattern. I feel like we keep recreating the same kind of energetic situations over and over. So there's a flavor to that of like. I've got nowhere to go. I got to make it work. I got to survive. Clearly, she's growing up in a household where at least the mother, you know, is perpetuating some sense of like, we got to do what we got to do. Like, it's us against the world. Um, So that's just kind of like a fundamental sense of what I get off her as far as like, what's the foundation of this insanity? (laughs) You know, I mean, as far as what we're seeing. So I want to say. Melissa and Danny coming in and confronting her right away about stuff like the vibe I get off that it's just like yeah it's I'm scrambling like oh shit here I am I'm on TV this new opportunity they're bringing something that's like not in my control I I gotta just say whatever the fuck I gotta say like I think that's why there's no sense in her of like listening and taking people in she feels like a kid who's caught who's in trouble who just knows I got to do and say whatever the F I got to do and say just to be good again. And, um, you know, I mean, look, the the whole Jamie, her husband thing opens up, you know, so much more. Um, I definitely felt, I mean, there was so much in that. I mean, I'll shut up in a second. I, the last two things I'll say is this. I think that it's clear. Julie 
in her development, clearly she likes to rebel as a way of kind of sticking up the middle face. She's been doing that since 2000. She was rebelling against her family. She was rebelling against Mormonism. Now she's like, you can almost feel her delight of inviting in being excommunicated from the Mormon church. It's like, and she even said, people thought I was going to leave Mormonism. I almost stayed in Mormonism just to like show them I wasn't leaving. Like she's got this thing in her, right? That's like, I'm just going to do what I want to do. So fuck you. So I think with the Jamie stuff, it seems clear this is something that stayed with her for a while. It starts to make me wonder if she was very invested in it at the time, perhaps felt in some way dismissed, forgotten about, and that there was this part of her that's like, oh, we're bringing this out. <laughs> I'm having these conversations. I want, you know, I want Jamie to know what this meant to me. But then also with her husband, you know, she made that one comment where she said he was a get like he was a he was out of my league. And I couldn't help but sort of wonder if some of this anyway was like, I'm going to show you like, yeah, I got something. I got Jamie here. I'm going to make you jealous. I don't know. I just was wondering about that for her. If this was a lot of this was about needling her husband and kind of putting him in less of a power position. But there's a lot here. Ryan, what would what did you think? What, now, what, which one's Julie? What is your take on Julie in general, but like specifically her housewifian desire to create good TV? You know, I love that she's like, he gave me a hall pass and my husband gave me a hall pass. I'm like, what about his wife and the kid? You're not even taking Jamie into consideration, it seems like. I can't tell if Jamie is merely humoring her, meaning like he he can obviously tell that she's nutty. So I can't tell if he's just humoring her by sort of like, get, like, why is he even getting in the hot tub at night? But Jamie, like I was saying earlier, you I can't read that dude. I cannot read that dude at all. <laughs> Jamie over I, here. I, I, our, our, our very own Jamie is having a conniption yeah. in the Zoom. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, because, you know, this started for me back watching the 2000 season because he he they really kind of had like a spark in 2000. And I remember watching that being like, what is going on? He, like, fearing for Jamie's life because I was like, no, don't go into the Venus flytrap. But honestly, <laughs> my sense of him, uh, Jamie's really interesting to me. My sense of him back in 2000 was like, oh, he, he likes that. She's got the devil in her. Like I could feel it. I was like, part of him is so excited by this devilish part of, of Julie. And you know, it, it's interesting, you know, Jamie's so interesting, right? Because he was presented as, the wealthy frat boy, you know, and has, you know, had all that sort of privilege. So like there's a way in which he came in sort of as the button down conservative guy. But as we all know, he also has this kind of like mischievous side and this spiritual seeker. And just the way that he was engaging with her back then of like, oh, man, like the way that I would kiss you. Clearly, there was this part of him that just was I just feel like he was so drawn into the darkness and that mm. Julie almost represented like a taste of that not just like the darkness in her but the part of him yeah that wants to sort of play with fire a bit and so bringing this back up to two that what year are we in 2022 <laughs> um i Look, Jamie was clearly embarrassed when she was bringing this stuff up. Now, do I think a level of that was, I've got kids at home, I've got a wife, I've got family watching this? Yes. But do I also kind of wonder if there was a part of this that was like, yeah, I I was turned on by the idea of like being the guy who opened up the horny little Mormon virgin and... Maybe there was an unconscious or semi-conscious place where it's like, I'm not going to, I like playing with the fire. I don't want to take full responsibility for what I'm opening up. I'm moving on. And I just wonder on some level in this place where Julie's now leaking all over about how big it was for her and sex this and sex that. And it's you, Jamie. I feel like on some level, like, is there a place where he's feeling a little bit caught? Like I got kind of caught in something that I did that was supposed to sort of stay behind the scenes and now I'm sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because she's revealing something vulnerable so I can't just shut this down and dismiss it 
But I'm also kind of confronted with something that I maybe, where I was maybe a little bit slippery. Like, that would make sense to me, but he confuses me. Like, because I'm like, this is so easy to step away from. Like, you you don't lead this person on, but it's not even like he's le- he's just there. He's just not leaving. And responding you know? with staying- things. Like, when she, when she had that speech about, I think that there could be, like, sex without love and, like, maybe blah, 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 blah. And he's just, like, cool confessional. Is he just, like, dumb? Well, no, I mean, but don't, aren't you guys, well, I'll just say, I, I, from the beginning of this, have been so drawn to middle-aged Jamie and how he's presenting on the show, because even during the challenges, like, there was this spark of life in him. You know, he he was the seeker, and he was traveling the world, and he was Jamie the adventurer, so I was excited to catch up with him, and then when he kind of stumbled into this season... And, and kind of seemed a little defeated to me and was like, yeah, I got a later start in life. And I, I think he may have, I don't know if I'm inventing this. Did he mention his wife as the breadwinner in the family? Or that's at least he like. He, he said he had a couple companies that went under or like he had a company that didn't do well and it, it, it crashed he mentioned or something that he like was a truck he dri- that. that he was a truck driver for a while. So, I mean, to me, there's just been kind of a, compared to the Jamie that we knew of yore, there's just been like kind of a defeated, I'm settled down now. Well, he life. thought he was going to be, <laughs> I don't he have thought he was going to be Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, he just doesn't have the same spark of life. And so, again, I mean, you know, you know, you guys, I always take this to like the deeper levels of patterning. I just kind of wonder for Jamie, like, let's just say I'm on to something that, like, there's something in him that's always been very drawn to the flame drawn to the fire drawn to the darkness but he's also got something in him that doesn't want to like fully own that go there let that run so he kind of like does things a little bit slippery with like julie the the horny mormon and then leaves it alone and now here he is in his life kind of like disconnected from his own you know, fiery force of will that maybe would go out there and be the next Mark Zuckerberg. So to me, just his overall vibe, I guess to answer your question, just like my take on him is that this is a guy who does have that fire and spice in him. And I think to this day, Julie still kind of brings that. It's like, she's playful. She's kind of unhinged. She's kind of dangerous. And I think part of Jamie fucking loves that. But I think he's at odds from that part of himself. So yeah, I guess this is what I'm saying. The same part of him that would almost maybe want to unconsciously use Julie for that juice is the same part of him that's also now kind of a little bit of a sad sack. What was going through your minds when Julie was attempting to hook up with the husband in public, like outside in the house, <laughs> outside of the house. I literally texted you in all caps saying, what is happening? Question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point. I was so confused and overwhelmed. Yeah, and I told you, save it for the pod. <laughs> so like now that you've had a day, maybe she is the brilliant producer. Like I can't tell like yes she is because ultimately she is making good tv julie's still stuck in this thing of not knowing even who she is and wanting to be something so badly like we all want to be something but i just sense that coming off her so much like this is my opportunity it's come back and i'm gonna leave here with all of these friends again and none of that's coming into play the only thing she has to grasp uh, grasp onto is maybe she could hook up with jamie if he can convince if she can convince him you know Yeah, and I want to say, like, I really agree with you, Ryan, because I know so many people are asking that question about kind of, is this the real Julie? Is this not the real Julie? And I'm like, yes, both. I just feel like Julie, regardless of whether there's a camera on her or not, is always going to be someone who's hyper conscious of how she's presenting. I think she's always going to be cultivating something. I think she's always going to have an angle. So, yeah, in this particular circumstance, she happens to be on a TV show. But I yeah. think you take the cameras away. Julie's always the star of her own TV show, whether there are cameras there or not. Now, yeah. Yeah. what that means for this hookup with her husband, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't like dropped into it specifically, but just the, the immediate flavor of it to me is like, yeah, I'm proving something. Like, I've got something to prove. I've got something to say. I'm doing this. We're doing this. We're showing them. You know, again, it's like she's got that rebel in her that I just think. But to me, it's like it's such a fake rebel. It feels like the rebellious kid. All they want is dad and mom to come along and impose some boundaries and like give them loving structure and support. And that's almost kind of like what I feel of her. Who tells their husband on camera of like Jamie has a meditation app. He also has got good porn. What is that? What? 
Like, I'm like, and, and he's like, oh, okay, okay. Like, whether they enjoy porn together as a couple makes no of no consequence to me. I don't care. But, like, you're going, like, the husband obviously was uncomfortable with her saying that on top of, okay, so you looked at Jamie's meditation app, but he also then showed you some porn? Like, what? These are those stories where you have to fill in the blanks where, like, I would, as a producer, like, stop. Hey, can we get more on what you just said? What did you, <laughs> what porn are you watching with Jamie? Like, I mean, like, these are, like, huge questions that why would you dangle that camera? It, it's almost like she then wanted him to be like, you can have a pass. Well, she's always been very coy. I mean, I remember back in 2000 when she kissed Jamie, like the way that she presented it, it's like, well, something may or may not have happened on the stairs. You know, it's, it's, oh God, it infuriates me. Like she likes to play coy. She likes the shock value. And I do, I just get this sense of, of her, of like, and just the more that she can throw out there, the better I feel like in her mind, it's a protest. I want to talk about the scene where Melissa brought in the tarot card reader. She, I, I remember she tells Melissa that it's time to get into politics, which I would be more than happy to see Melissa on The View. Like, she clearly has something to say, and I think she'd be wonderful in that platform. But she also says to Danny that he continues to carry secrets and to hold his energy back. And it's time for him, I forget the card that she pulled, but it's time for him to step up with some, you know, like girl boss energy and a big sword, which he agrees. What did you think of that scene? It's funny, I forgot the tarot reader said that, and uh, I completely agree with her. I mean, I think what's interesting about Danny, just based on, like, for example, hearing him on your podcast, is, you know, in 2000, there was such a kind of a passivity to his story in the way that, you know, friends suggested he go on the show. You know, it really wasn't a vehicle of his own drive you know and then even he happened to be in this relationship with paul which happened to put him in the forefront of don't ask don't tell there was all this stuff that he just kind of stumbled into which is really interesting to me and i feel like my experience of him today it's clear that he's developed a lot more of his voice and it does feel like he has more agency but i agree with the tarot reader it's like when i watch him i'm like oh man that i feel like there's more that wants to come through and he feels like this higher self, like voice of wisdom that comes in and cuts through the shit. And I just, I don't know. I just get curious about that for Danny. I feel like there's more, there's more heat there that he could be accessing. And I think that's kind of, yeah, maybe the task ahead of him right now of like how much of that strong kind of righteous energy are you willing to really step in and own without apology and really sort of take the reins of your life energetically and just in terms of your life and your life decisions? I just, there's this sense of weariness to him now that wasn't there originally. Of course, it just, I'm not to re, you know, it just feels like life beat him down at some point. And even when he talks about it, I know he has a daughter, but he's like, yeah, man, I've been hidden away in the woods for, well, you know, been, like he this. He has been through the most. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so you see that, you see that physically, you see like, he's still like a very handsome, good looking man, but like, you just see how life kind of happened all over him. Thoughts about the production. Parts of it are brilliantly produced and parts of it are so lacking. Like what, there are some episodes where we barely even see Tokyo. And I feel like the gaps in knowledge of like, we still don't, like I said, we still don't know really even what Kelly does for a living. Okay, she's taking the time while we're filming this show to write this book, okay? And we don't... I mean, Scott Wolf, we got to see Scott Wolf from Party of Five was like so excited to get a Scott Wolf cameo, but you're right. Up until this episode, there had been real, like I, she had been so quiet and I was just like, if you watch the old episodes, she's like throwing in, she's like, you know, it's just, and she's really become dimin diminutive and it could be the cameras, it could be all of that, the production, like I'm sure it's very uncomfortable to get back into the swing of that things. So like I, I champion the production in the sense that it even exists to begin with, but it seems sloppy in a lot of ways. And to me, like we said, that that throw up going down the hallway, the Sade, I know that's a sm small, funny moment. But to me, that's what the real world is. Those moments set to those kind of music that we even know to me that like hit all my pleasure buttons in terms of real world. But there is a to me, a sloppiness that I can kind of understand, because how do you. You know, this isn't the same crew. This isn't the same relationships they have. Like it took, they got six, 
months in those houses before with this cast. They're getting two and a half weeks now. Like it takes two and a half weeks to probably warm up to cameras but no, for a but lot I of these feel, people. But I feel like there's stuff that production could have done. They could have told they could have done a much better job storytelling for the audience. Storytelling catching us up as to their lives, filming maybe more than like clearly one hour you know them flying to each of their homes and yes probably danny's like no i don't i'm not going to talk about my job like he has a real job and they all have well some of them have real jobs some of them are stay-at-home moms but i feel like production could have done a, a better job on behalf of the audience i feel like they were so focused on them they're not focused on the viewing audience like as somebody who thinks with a producer mind I would have done this differently. I would have packaged it a bit differently. No, I agree with you. I I would much rather, I I wish we would catch up with them. I I wish we would see them in their home lives. I wish they would catch us up on the last 20 years. I wish there were, you know, it's interesting when I was working on the real world one, and I wonder, I think I actually may have seen her name on the new Orleans season. So she may have been one of the lead directors on their original season, but she was a woman who I want to say either was a, at one time a working psychologist or like had her like graduate degree in psychology. But, you know, the director, you know, who is in charge, for example, of like conducting the interviews when they're in their, you know, they're talking head interviews, you know, so they were really um, intentionally penetrating them on a deeper level. And so I think to bring that kind of level of penetration to what have the last 20 years been like? What was the impact of this show on you? What are you doing now? And let us get to know them and then bringing them together so that we have context and understanding. Um, I agree with you. It feels a sort of like a little slapdash put together, I think. And I also, I don't personally like how produced it is in terms of, for example, bringing Paul in when it's not organic. It seems like Julie's husband, that was like another stunt production. Was okay, so I actually him. checked with Danny today on that. And I said, yeah. was it as organic and natural as Paul's? And he said... He really was in town for a conference. He didn't want to be on camera. She, Julie forced him. And did they know? Because it just seems so convenient that he was there for her Mormonism package. Was that kind of like, oh, he's going to be here. So let's air this now. I, that's a great question, though. The, it is so produced, like with those like cheesy incoming message and like, this is the theme going to be the theme of the episode. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, well, I mean, one thing I want to say too, and I spoke about this on your podcast before, like back in the day, real world was not produced at all in terms of this kind of stuff. There was nothing that was, set, I mean, yeah, they set them up with the job. They're going on a trip. They do their interview. There's a structure to the show that's set up beyond that. Those kids are doing what they're doing and no one's like setting anything up. So it is disappointing for me to see how produced it is. And I feel like homecoming it almost felt to me like in New York, the incoming messages, it just felt like, okay, this is kind of a cool structure to get them talking and whatever. And it was almost like it felt to me like Buna Murray then realized the potential of that when all the shit went down with Becky. Mm-hmm. And now the incoming messages are there specifically to dig things up. And and I actually, I did reach out to a friend of mine and I was like, look, on the first season of this, like, I don't think you guys were doing these incoming messages specifically just to incite drama. And yeah, my friend was like, no, we, we weren't. So, you know, I think it's sort of evolving. I feel like they kind of found their formula and it's evolving into it. And I, I don't like that aspect of it. The one thing I will say, though, to kind of speak, I think, to your ambivalence, I do think it's really well edited. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's and I think what I will give Bina Murray credit for, it's like they are certainly breaking that fourth wall. And I do think, I do feel certain good intentions. I do feel a certain responsibility to take responsibility for things. So, you know, things like really making sure, for example, that Melissa gets that time and space to speak to that storyline when that guy used that racist slur and feeling like she was let down by production. You know, I I Mm -hmm. appreciate them including that stuff. And I mean, if I'm being honest, that just speaks to my experience of what it was like to work at BMP. Like, it was sort of this mixed bag where you could feel they wanted to do something good and right, which is why we have the real world, which has all those issues, right? But then there were also places and ways where it's like, you know, they wouldn't fully trust doing the right thing all the way. So instead, we got to 
pay these kids five grand and then show them out the door and not really take responsible for what we just put them through. You know, it's like it was a real mixed bag. And that's what Homecoming feels like to me. The first two seasons of Homecoming, I feel the same way. I mean, this is just seems to be like it's almost too much. And then they end up throwing like a 90s party at the very end to try to sum it all up, you know, and it's like it's too much. Like, I think it's too much of a job and they don't seem really they don't seem to have thought it out in a way that makes tons of sense. And I don't know if that's post-production or pre-production or what is happening. But yeah, there are a lot of huge gaps, but it's like when you're starving, you know, you'll take a cracker and make a meal out of it. And to me, I'm like, I'll take it. I'll take it. It doesn't matter. I'll take it. I'll watch it. And I'm just happy it exists. And also Ryan, before you leave, I want to get your thoughts on David slash Tokyo's transformation shocking to me i mean i never thought i'd see him in like a sergeant pepper style uniform with the hair but i will like what an indelible mark he has made in me ever since like i remember come on be my i remember me and my friends singing it again and again in fact the first episode of my podcast i talk about that moment was a so bad it's good moment one of the things that sticks with me i think about it every week and to hear it again i get emotional i get choked up it meant so much to me it's i it, i can't explain and i want like and just to see that that's that guy and you see the same old David in there sometimes and sometimes you see him grow past who he was I mean it's very David like and the fact they'll show these YouTube things of him cooking and I'm like this is pretty good like (laughs) They'd be like, do that. Put the clams in the bucket. Put the clams in. I'm like, whoa, I like this, you know? But he, to me, is a top five reality show moment of all time with that song. Like, it just it just planted a flag in me so long ago. And it's why I keep coming back to all reality shows is moments like that. What's hilarious. And he was talented back in the day. Let's just. Yeah. Listen, he can still say. Like, no, I'm not saying it was a horrible song. I'm saying, come on. It was the Zabadui, Zabadui. You know, like he could. He hit all those notes. It was like, but it just the seriousness in which he took it. I love people that take things that seriously. It's like the Sandoval of it. Of like, oh yeah, oh, yeah I love that. Sandoval I novels. love it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was so excited to have this come back just for him. Like, I mean, not I liked all of them, but just for him especially. And I still don't really have any of his story. I mean, I don't know. So it's a big, it's a big lost mystery of the TV like, show Lost. Where I'm like, what what happened? I wish I could jam with you guys for another couple hours because I could keep talking about this stuff forever. So if I need to come back later on after I'm done, I'm always happy to get no, time. Listen, Hollywood's, so, Hollywood's calling. Yeah. Ryan has to. Yeah, Ryan yeah has, barely. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan has to go. Thank you. Sorry, I have to go. No, you guys. thank you. So this was this was perfect. Um, OK, Jamie, we'll stay on. Jamie, what do you think Julie's intention was? in coming back into this i mean i'm sure i'm sure she was the first one to sign on like we know that melissa and kelly were the last to sign on i'm sure you know once they got danny she was uh jumping out of her seat i you know it's funny it's like when i i I, maybe what i'll even do is kind of drop in here but i will say kind of when i've just let myself feel around a little bit I do definitely get this possible flavor of like, I I get to do it my way this time in some way. Like if she were still inhibited, let's say by her Mormonism and just, you know, the ties of her culture and her family, it's like, Oh, I get to do this again. And I get to do it my way. Almost this possible flavor of like something was taken from me. Like, this opportunity, what I would have wanted to have done with it. I didn't get to do with it all the way. And this time I get to do this again and I get to do it my way. Maybe a feeling of like it somehow could have been different, would have been different if only, if only, if only. And now I get a fucking do over and I'm taking it. And this is, yeah, it's my turn to do this how I want, which, you know, might make sense out of you know those moments where it's like i'm out there i'm making good tv like i want to make sure this show pops yeah i mean she said it herself like i took one for the team does seem like she's the only one that's willing to play the reality tv game or is even interested yeah and i'm so ambivalent about that because part of me deeply resents her for it because it's true it's like i don't i don't want to watch the demented machinations Mm -hmm. of julie the TV producer whose taste in TV I don't even really trust, you know, but at the same time, you know, in fairness, the rest of the crew who, by the way, I, well, with the exception of Matt, I'm not really enjoying Matt, but everyone else I'm enjoying as people to varying degrees, but they all seem so guarded Mm -hmm. 
and so not trusting in the process or Buna Murray. And I'm not saying they're not justified, but you know, it does leave you to wonder if Julie weren't there, what would we be watching? However, having said that, you could also bring in the question, Julie, and I think Kelly is speaking to this, is a huge part of why I also think there is distrust. So maybe if Julie weren't there and there were more of a feeling of, yeah, realness, camaraderie, and safety, maybe they'd be more willing to bring themselves out fully. Maybe part of the reason why they are so guarded is precisely because Julie's in the mix as this unhinged uh, court jester. Uh, Danny said in an interview that he didn't think Kelly would ever was ever going to do it. And he thinks that she did it as a gift to them to allow it to happen. Because obviously it's been well documented. Una Murray's not doing this with a missing cast member. And she did this in serve, you know, she obviously doesn't need the money. She did this to, so that the people who need, I really think it's about the money that these people don't want to be on TV with the exception of Julie. Yeah. Like I think that was like beautifully said by Danny. It was, it, it, this was a, pr- a, a, ri- a written article. Um, I just found that to be kind of beautiful that like Kelly actually, while people are criticizing in a way Kelly the most, cause she's just sitting in her room writing her book it hinged on her the most to even exist in the first place. I think it's okay for me to say this. I know at one point there were rumblings about maybe doing a Las Vegas homecoming. And I just know from things that I've heard, yeah, I mean, it plays into it, this sense of if you're the missing Jenga piece, you know, you could kind of be, you know, depriving other people of an opportunity that they may want or even feel like they need. And it's an, it's an interesting dynamic. And I think it starts to also speak to that, bond that never goes away amongst these cast members even if they don't like each other did did danny or someone call it a trauma bond recently i thought that was like mm. such a great way of putting it but totally. you know there there is this bond and even even for someone like me who wasn't on the cast you know working in post production on these shows like i you know i was on the phone with arissa the other day you know arissa from vegas but you know we were talking about those old days, you know, and that season of Vegas. And it just, I I could feel it just brought up such deep feelings of like sentiment and being a part of something and a moment in time and like the experience. So I think um, there is a bond between these people that will never go away. And yeah, I think to your point, I, I, I think that weighs heavy on a lot of people as they consider this kind of thing. What do you think of Tokyo's transformation, both his personality and appearance, he kind of made himself disappear in a way. Just, you know, no online presence, I don't think, prior to this. Like, we never really heard from him again. And I found it interesting that Danny said he thinks Tokyo is the most traumatized by this. Um, I wish I had followed up on that. Like, do you feel that, that he's traumatized by the original experience? I mean, it's tough to say, to Ryan's point, I almost feel like we really haven't touched down that much on him. I I mean, there's a couple things I'll say. I just want to say, I really want to say in rewatching the original season, I find myself feeling so much compassion for him. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I get it. I get that he was a difficult personality. I get I wouldn't have wanted to live with him. But my memory of him from all those years ago was just kind of the difficult... Uh, fly in the ointment and I really didn't remember that there was a lot of vulnerability there in his relationship to his mother and the pressure that he was putting on himself to like succeed for the sake of his mother who he wanted to take care of in the sense of like reclaiming experiences I guess my experience as a viewer it is interesting for me to remember the narrative that was written about these cast members from many of the different seasons in retrospect and then to go back and revisit the seasons and see what it actually was mm-hmm. because like Tammy's another one from LA where I remember her reputation was as like the bitch you know and the one who got David kicked out and all this stuff and when I rewatched it I was like man there's so much more to her. She was wise. She was vulnerable. She actually really wasn't the one who even like was the spearheading David's exit. There was so much more to her. And so I don't know. I just, for some reason, I want to just state and claim that David, there was something, this was clearly a guy who was struggling and I felt really bad for him rewatching it. Having said all that, 
my limited experience of him on Homecoming, it's almost like the pendulum in some ways sometimes has like swung to the complete opposite direction of being open, of being available. And it's interesting, too, because when he was fighting with Julie, there was that one moment that felt like the old David where he said, I'm either with you all the way or I'm not with you at all. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's, that's the old him. binary yeah. David. And so for me, you know, it just speaks to there's still something in him that I think is a little bit black, white, binary. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I wonder in the place where he's clearly made a decision to soften. I wonder if he's kind of maybe overcorrected sometimes in a way where he's not maybe fully in alignment with whatever his deepest truth is in that moment because he wants to be this kinder, softer, gentler version of himself, maybe. I guess when it comes to Melissa, is she just the most well-adjusted person to come out of reality TV? I mean, is there even, like, what do you even get off Melissa? Like, she is just obviously the fan favorite, still hilarious, clearly a star. If she truly wants the opportunity, I think she is the one that this could actually reignite a career. I, you know, I would just be curious to ask her, like, but do you really want that? I, that feels like a really real question for her, because I think what I'm so struck by, I mean, yes, it's been a joy to watch her on this show. It's been a joy to watch her evolution. And I think what has stood out to me the most with her is just the contrast in her temperament. You know, like I think in the year 2000, and she said this in the year 2000, I, there was something in her that wanted the attention. Like she was, she was grabbing for something. And so, yes, she was boisterous and she was, she was, you know, always kind of in center stage. And to see her come into this experience, I I, like she's, she's found her inner quiet. And to me anyways, I mean, this is just my vibe on things. It feels like the real Melissa. It feels authentic to who she is. It feels like somewhere along the way she she got in touch with and cultivated and was able to rest into the inner quiet that I think before was just intolerable to her and for her. And it's beautiful. And then she still has like Melissa. She's still funny. She's still got spice, but it's like she's not reaching for anything. So, you know, to your point, it's like, you were mentioning her being on The View, which, you know, I mean, to be clear, I'm not that familiar with The View. I've seen bits and pieces, but there was part of me that was like trying to plug in Melissa's kind of graceful quiet and her powers of quiet observation in that setting. And I was like, would that setting even work for her? You know, like would her energy fit in that mix? I'm not saying it wouldn't, but when I hear you bring in this question, kind of like she's the one to go off and do things. If she wants to, great. I'd love to see her. I just get curious for Melissa in this place where it feels like there's this graceful quiet in her and clearly she relishes like the life that she's created. I just get curious for her. Like what, what is it that you want? You know what I mean? If you could set it up any way that you want, what do you want? And is it, yeah, that life in the public eye? I mean, look, she's clearly got things to say. I'm remembering in our interview, maybe she did say she wants to be more behind the scenes. Like I know she wrote a pilot based on her life. And I and I'm remembering now, like maybe she doesn't want to be in front of the camera, but rather like a writer, because like that was something that she always did, you know, post real world. Maybe that's it. And she'll be taken seriously because she's now people are familiar with her. Like she's she can get into rooms now and people will know who she is. I you know, the other thing I just want to say is just I really want to acknowledge the way that she handled that whole Julie. I mean, first of all, I think she single-handedly saved the show from disaster. Like the way that she came in and just so clearly named what Julie was doing as far as being the TV producer Mm -hmm. and the way she brought that in, the way that she's dealt with Julie every step of the way. I mean, I almost feel like you could... You almost could feel that she knew going in, like, I'm making a choice. I am not letting this woman get under my skin. I'm not letting her ruffle my feathers. I am not letting her take me any type of place, um, you know, where I'm going to sort of lose it. Um, Not like in a controlling way, but just like in a like a self-possessed, like finding my inner Zen way. And I just want to say, like, the way that Melissa has modeled, yet the willingness to just name what's happening to name what's coming up for her to say hey this is what's going on in a non-reactive way her boundaries it's just been powerful and in that place that kind of says like i don't need you to agree with me you don't have to like come around and see my point of view this is just what's true for me 
period the end and i'm not playing this game with you i it's 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 really been inspiring like i just think it's been a master class of someone damn true to what they see here think and feel and then also the willingness to take responsibility for her part too like that moment where she said yeah i did kind of let julie get the best of me i was saucy let me let me clean up that one part of my side of things so i it's just it's it's really been a joy to watch her in action I know we talked about which seasons we we want them to do. What do you think they will do? What's the sm- what's the don't... smart move? Oh, what's the smart move? If they do, I don't know. I'm not convinced we're getting another one for some. I am. I'm not I, saying we're Jamie. I am based on the success. I feel like this is a cultural moment. And yes, like I'm tapped into stuff, but also from like bird's eye view, this is just being covered in media at large. All right. Well, let's just go with the idea that it's going. What's the smart move? I mean, I guess, okay, if you're kind of talking to me like from a producer's perspective, if New Orleans is the one that's hit, I feel like, yeah, doing another one from that era. I mean, I I guess I'm inclined towards Hawaii. That feels like it'd be the smart move. Or Miami. Yeah, Miami would be a good one. I heard rumblings at one point that Justin from Hawaii was like MIA. Like literally no one could find him. It was as if he disappeared off the face of the earth. But lately I heard from someone not even connected to Buna Murray that apparently like Amaya is in contact with him. So maybe that's not true anymore. But it seems like Hawaii, there'd be a a solid chance you could get all seven. And that's from that same era. I feel like Miami is kind of similar. That seems like one where you could maybe get all seven. And it's mostly from that era. So I'd go Miami. I mean, look, Seattle would be great. Seattle also has kind of moral questions about Steven and whether it's cool to like put that group back together with Steven. Because he's has a history of violence. Yeah, I don't think he, I mean, look, I don't know where he is today, but I don't think that guy was doing well mentally. Didn't Danny mention that he was arrested for hooking? Yeah. And also he mentioned on your podcast that uh, I guess he woke up one night on a challenge and like Steven was standing over yes. him. And... Anybody who didn't listen to the full Danny re-release, you're in for some juicy tea if you <laughs> if you stick with it long enough. Any final thoughts? Like I said before, I'm so happy for any opportunity to catch up with these people and I watch it every Wednesday and like I said, I'm going to watch every Homecoming that comes out. I do wish there were a way to do this show such that it created safety and trust for the cast members to really well to both come in and kind of like put it all out there but to also be supported in taking part in something that is like healing for them which i think look i think we all know if the money weren't there they wouldn't be there so we know that that's the the driving factor but i have to imagine slash i somewhat sense that the paycheck is the big draw Kind of like what I was saying with Jamie being lured into the devil of Julie. Like, I think there's always something a little bit in the devil of the real world that's going to lure them back in because it is this sort of once in a lifetime thing that had an impact on all their lives. And I'm sure they go into it wanting some sort of, like I said, like healing, closure, reclaiming something. So I feel like it would just be such a gift to the cast members and to the audiences if we could ultimately create something that really supports them to come out the other side of something. I mean, this is kind of like my pipe dream vision of what this could be, but you know, I'll be there for the, I'll be there for the disjointed distrust (laughs) in the drama and all of it. (laughs) Tell everybody about the recent, yeah. Tell everybody about the recent episode you did with Arissa from Vegas. Yeah. So I did, uh, basically what I did was a live full length intuitive reading with Arissa and uh, I did it like in a zoom room and people could come and witness the reading and in doing so you know relate and respond to what was coming up for Arissa so Arissa brought in a question about a loss that she had a four years ago and she was looking for closure around it and so yeah we did a full length intuitive reading and then in the wake of that I opened it up to questions, you know, for people to kind of really reflect about. So kind of almost like what we do with reality TV, right? Hopefully it's like we watch these people on the screen and it causes us to think about ourselves. Arissa kind of offered herself up as a catalyst in this intuitive reading. And then people get to kind of like experience the energy and think about it for themselves. And um, I actually, with this one, I did just release it as a podcast episode. So if people want to hear it, you know, they can go and listen to an edited version. And 
the next one's coming up next month. I mean, if I may be so bold as to plug it yes, here. I'm gonna plug be, it. Plug yeah. away. Give the date. Let people know how to sign up. Yeah, no, I'm going to be doing, it just got confirmed. I'll be doing an intuitive reading with Jerry Manthe of Survivor fame. Yeah, so I guess if you're listening, by the time you're hearing this, if you are interested in attending that live, uh, just head to my website, hollywoodreadings.com and email me and let me know. And then I'll send you information on how to register. Perfect. And tell everybody just the name of your podcast um, and where to follow you on Instagram, all that stuff. So my podcast is Deep Dive with Jamie Stein and a lot of uh, Bravo related content and sometimes real world content and other sort of things. It's a psycho spiritual look at uh, pop culture and reality TV. And then, yeah, follow me on Instagram, Jamie Stein, J-A-M-I-E-S-T-E-I-N. I do create exclusive content just for the gram. <laughs> And uh, and if you're interested in my work, you can, of course, head to my website as well. Everyone, uh, you can follow me, JessXNYC. Uh, check out videos on YouTube. They're all right there if you just plug in hot takes and deep dives. And Jamie, Ryan, and I will see you soon. 